Uh, good morning also. Um, I would like to discuss anticoagulation, and anticoagulation is probably one of the big challenges when you use extracorporeal circulation. Um, the problem is that we are aware, all of us, that there are some thromboembolic events in those patients. But for those who do not survive and where you actually do an autopsy afterwards, you see that the incidence is even bigger. What also is important to, to notice is that if you look to the number of incidents, that especially during the first 10 days, there is an increase of these numbers. So meaning the anticoagulation and the control of thrombosis is a major issue during this uh, uh, type of therapy. On the other hand, we also know that if we have a patient post cardiotomy, that we can run him for probably 24 hours up to 48 hours without any anticoagulant at all because the whole coagulation system has been disrupted. On the other hand, we know if that is not recuperating, if he's not needing any heparin at all, that he most likely will not survive. And most likely the reason for that is that uh, his liver function never will recuperate. So it means that there is this dilemma. We need a certain amount of anticoagulation in order to have a good survival and to prevent thromboembolic events. But on the other hand, if we give nothing, then probably this is a very poor sign of outcome. And then how are we going to monitor them? Because we are still using mainly unfractionated uh, heparin. And we all know that both APTT and ACT, they are very poor in predicting the concentration of heparin. The only thing which is quite reliable is anti-10A, but it's cumbersome, it's uh, expensive, you can't do it on the spot, and so on. And the problem with this is also that we believe that we can actually control anticoagulation by just looking at anti-10A. I disagree, because we are also interested in what is the inhibition of factor 2, thrombin. If we have no good inhibition, then you might have a very nice inhibition of factor 10A, but it will not be enough. And this is what we mainly will see after a procedure. This was an uneventful procedure. The patient survived, but nevertheless, you can see there is some thrombotic material on the venous side of this oxygenator or artificial lung. So why do we have this type of problems? Well, the reason of that is probably that we have simplified anticoagulation and coagulation too much over the last 30 years. We actually would like to have something very simple, and that's what we actually constructed. We had one test for the intrinsic activation, we had one test for the extrinsic activation, and we should never forget those tests are done on plasma. So actually we exclude whatever interaction with cells. Now that works fine as long as you have not very sick patients, because then probably most of the cells will not be activated. But this does not work, for, uh, work uh, very fine if you have a situation where patients actually have a lot of cellular activation. And for that reason, a new concept was introduced, and I think it's a very important uh, concept in respect to especially post-surgical patients, that what we actually have is that the coagulation starts on tissue factor-bearing cells. And those cells will only release small amounts of thrombin. Normally, we have an inhibition system, the antithrombin tree, it will take it out and nothing will happen. But in some cases, when you already have already activated platelets, these small amounts of thrombin, they will pre-prime those platelets. And that can lead to a real burst of thrombin inside the patient. And that's the reason we have to understand that the anticoagulation, the coagulation of the patient, it's very dynamic. You can have a patient in the morning, everything is fine. And two hours later, it's becoming a mess. And this is because the system is dynamic and can change quite rapidly. So how do we look at it? Well, we have to see that the typical cascade system as we know it, it's still existing, of course, it's still valid, but we have to see it in combination with cells. And this means that the extrinsic activation will be activated on tissue factor bearing cells. And for us, very important that the intrinsic activation, which is mainly extracorporeal systems, is actually generated on the surface of activated platelets. So platelets will be an extremely important component when we actually do the anticoagulation management of an ECMO. And then we have another problem, because if you want to control it, you want to have a good view of what's happening with this anticoagulation. And what we do mainly is we just look to the initial generation of thrombin. But you would be surprised if you take this type of test in a patient and you would actually allow it to go further on. Sometimes you will see there is a small amount of thrombin and then it goes back to a fluid state.
meaning that the test would give you a value and you would say I'm safe or I'm not safe, but actually it does not represent the real situation in the patient. So what we need is something which allows us to see what's happening after this initial thrombin formation. Is there still a continuous buildup of fibrin and platelet contraction or is it just delayed? And in order to do that, I think it's very important to use viscoelastic testing. What you can see here is an example. There are several machines on the market. Uh, here is no heparin, so you see there is a rapid and drastic conversion from fibrinogen to fibrin. We have a very nice contraction of the platelets, and this means you have a very good coagulation system. And as we now start to introduce heparin, a very small amount, only just 0.1 unit, normally we would like to have during ECMO around 0.4, 0.3, then you can see that this, uh, there is still the potential to form it, but it's delayed. And that's actually the situation what we would like. For example, we would like to have this situation as ideal in our patient. And if we go further on, as you can see here, we further increase. Finally, there is no platelet interaction anymore. And as you can imagine, those patients will start to bleed in their nose, in their mouth, and whatever you can think of. Um, so another important issue to know is if you use these tests, you will see that anti-10A is not enough. I cannot stress on that because what you would see here is APTT or ACT. But as you can see, the, the potential on this patient to form thrombin uh, is very, very low. That means he has a very nice inhibition of anti-10A combined with a very nice inhibition of 2A. But this is a very important situation and that happens from time to time you have a value which is acceptable so you have anti 10a inhibition but you do not have the inhibition of 2a and these are the patients who start to develop all types of thrombus inside the circuit so although we still use unfractionated heparin we do know that if we look to patients who actually have thrombus in their circuit versus those who had none that there are some factors which play a role one of them is free plasma hemoglobin, and I will discuss that in a few minutes. The other one is whether that would be a patient who has already had surgery, and this is a very challenging group, I can tell you, much more challenging than venovenous. And then, as you can see, there are some other factors which also apparently plays a role. Now, if we use unfractionated heparin, we have to remind uh, us that it actually only works in an efficient way when you have sufficient antithrombin-3. Now, for those who probably are not aware of that, but if you have extensive cardiac surgery, you can lose up to 60% of your antithrombin-3. So if you put a patient after postcardiotomy on an ECMO, most likely this system will not work. And you have a very high risk that you need huge amounts of heparin in order to have sufficient anticoagulation, and nevertheless the patient will bleed. Antithrombin-3 allows you in that way to reduce the amount of heparin. As you can see here, this is the situation before it was substituted. Here it has been substituted and we have a much lower uh, need for heparin in those patients. Now you could wonder, why should we be concerned on the amount of heparin? Well, I can tell you it's extremely important. For example, this is a clini clinical case. You can see, we see the start of thrombus formation inside this artificial lung. Here, antithrombin-3 was substituted and there is um, let's say a quite well uh, reconversion of the, the coagulation, meaning we can actually avoid or delay the exchange of a system which has a drastic impact on the patient condition. Also important to know is antithrombin-3 is also important in patient outcome. If you do have very low values, it's not only a problem of high heparinization, but it also gives a lot of adverse uh, events in a patient. And what's the reason? Well, a lot of people probably don't know, but if you have small amounts of thrombin, and this is your endothelium, this will actually increase the endothelial gap, and patients will start to, to form edema. We have even evidence that this will actually increase or uh, disrupt the blood-brain barrier in, uh, inside the patient. So meaning that if we control coagulation, we can also indirectly control the inflammatory response. So platelets are activated and 
don't forget they are also activated by heparin and that's the reason why we want to reduce it as low as possible and that's the reason why we want to substitute antithrombin 3 when it's too low. And you can see here an example, those white stripes here, these are activated platelets in this unit. And normally what we would like to see this, this is a brand new device and that's what is actually the dissection of this device after its usage, you can see there is a lot of uh, platelet formation on site these fibers. Now, in some cases, you can actually prevent this by just adding small amounts of aspirin. And this was done in uh, this case. It was the same oxygenator you saw just before. And as you can see, visually, it's already a lot better. What's the background of that? The background is that normally if you have an activation of your platelets by ADP, then you have, of course, a good aggregation. The aggregation is even better if you add small amounts of heparin. While if you give aspirin, you can bring it up. And by doing so, you will save platelets. And that's very important because it also means that you will need less platelet, platelet transfusions in the patient. If we talk patients, do not forget, patients and fibrinolysis are enemies. Why? Because fibrinolysis, plasmin, is eating the GP1B receptor on your platelets. So it prevents that those platelets can adhere and stop the bleeding. This is an example out of our clinical practice where you can see that the patient actually develops, this was the normal situation, a fibrinolysis, and he starts to bleed everywhere where we have mucosal um, uh, uh, barriers. As you can see here, he got some teranexamic acid, and we have a recuperation of the situation, and the bleeding stopped after a relatively short period of time. So hemolysis is another important point. People believe that hemolysis is not a big issue during ECMO. I believe it's a very, very important issue. First of all, because if you have hemolysis, you need more and more heparin. Because due to the exposure of the inner side, the phospholipid part of your red blood cell, you actually create a thrombotic situation. So to end, what could we use better than heparin? Well, there are a few options. One of them is a direct thrombin inhibitor, because thrombin is actually what we are really interested in. And as you can see from the study from Ranucci, you can steer it quite well. The big advantage, though, is if you use this, look to the decrease in platelet transfusion, showing once again the importance of preventing thrombin formation, which then in a second phase will activate the platelets. But the problem with this type of um, uh, anticoagulation is that wherever you have stasis, this is of course not from an ECMO, but it's difficult to show that in an ECMO circuit, but wherever you have stasis, you will have thrombus formation. And this is an issue because sometimes we have low flow, sometimes we have a shunts or whatever where you will actually develop. More promising though is a factor 7A inhibitory antibody. And this is new. It's uh, the first studies date from 2014, as you can see. What have they done? This is a control. There was no heparinization, no anticoagulant, and as you can see, almost immediately those fibers are blocked by thrombus. In the second situation, the blue line, you have heparin, and as you can see, there is some formation because there is activation, but it's still open. We can actually treat the patient. And in number three, we see this, uh, this antibody for 7A, and now you can see there is a very, very nice uh, opening of this uh, fiber stack. What is important though is that the results for the risk for bleeding are comparable with saline. That means we actually have a patient where we just take away the negative effect at the level of the foreign material, but we maintain to a certain degree and a very high degree the potential for the patient to clot. So finally, I think if you do ECMO, there are lots of connections. We have discussed them. There are lots of things we can do, but this is one of the major challenges even today. How do we control hemostasis? We do know that our tests are insufficient. I can tell you, you need more than APTT, ACT or PT. We should do them on whole blood, especially when you have postcardiotomy patients. And I think AT thrombin 3 should be checked on a daily basis so that you can actually do the substitution. We should treat hyperactive platelets. Although it can sound strange that the patient who is bleeding, that you will give a small amount of aspirin to stop the bleeding. 
And then, of course, we should sure need better drugs and better monitoring to improve our therapy. Thank you very much.